Every Sunday night, we're in the book of Revelation. We've been in this book for going on three years. Most preachers don't know how to get through two messages. Most of them can't get through one on it. And uh, I have spent years of researching all of these different words and culture and customs. And that's really all you have to do to understand something. If you're if you're studying a book, look up every word in the book, especially any important looking phrases. But you've got to have the tools or the library to do it. So that's the most important thing you need to invest in is the proper library. In fact, I was telling Danny, I believe it was the other day, I said, if you get come into $40,000, don't go buy a new car with it. I mean, in about four years, the new car that you spend $40,000 for is going to be worth about five or 6000 and the library is still going to be there. In fact, about eight or nine years, that $40,000 car is going to be worth about 2500 So uh, the most important thing is, is studying the correct books. That is our tools in understanding the Scripture. And I'm taking some time out on Sunday night and Wednesday night to relate to you some of the manners and customs of the Jews in the first century so that we can understand the Bible. And I'm using this book right here. I'm going to go into some more books, but I'm using this book on manners and customs by Fred White. I've had this, I guess, 25, 26 years, and I've got one that uh, I find very interesting. Uh, Marcella got this for me. It's got some really good stuff in it. Paul's Metaphors. We're going to look at some things out of this. And then you've got uh, Mr. Edersheim's book. Particularly, he's got one called uh, uh, the... uh, well, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, no. Oh, here it is right here. Yeah. Sketches of the Jewish social life. Tells you about everyday things in the Jews' life. And I'm reading some things out of this. They lived in a Roman-dominated world. They had all kinds of Greek culture, Greek languages, Greek philosophies. But they also had Greek lang- uh Hebrew languages and Hebrew philosophies. We've talked about the Jews. They lived in this little bitty, uh, this little bitty state on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Most of of the western border of Israel is a coastal line there. And of course, we're talking about their. We've talked about all kinds of vocations that they had. How that they. They were hunters and how that they uh, were carpenters and they were fishermen and, and they worked in metal and they were metal workers, potters. Uh, they were masons of all kinds. Uh, they did stonework, uh, their vineyards, how they were planted, uh, how they harvested them, how the potters worked on their wheels. And this week we've been talking some about the merchants in the marketplace, and let me read a little bit to you uh, about Oriental buying and selling. Uh, When we say Oriental, the Jews were called the first Orientals. We always think of of, uh, China or Japan or the Far East. Uh, uh, We think of Cambodia or Laos. These are Oriental people. But the first Orientals were the Jews. Let me read to you about Oriental buying and selling. This is quite different from purchasing in the West. No fixed price is put upon whatever is to be sold. Ordinarily, the buyer must expect to spend from a few minutes to an hour or so to complete a purchase. Boy, how would you like to go shopping with your wife there? Uh, The merchant begins by asking a high price and the buyer by offering a low price. Then the bargaining continues in earnest. To a stranger, this process of striking a bargain is a tedious one indeed. But the true Orientals enjoy it greatly. Among them... Haggling over prices and controversy, argument, and excitement usually become heated. When the sale is made, the buyer will go away to boast of his splendid bargain 
and will be greatly admired by the seller. The book of Proverbs pictures such a purchaser. It is bad, it is bad, saith the buyer, but when he has gone his way, then he boasteth. That's in Proverbs 20 and 14. I've read other things on buying and selling. They say that, and what this is, this is a contract. It's the same thing when we speak of a covenant or a testament. And I read one writer, and he said they will argue and fuss and haggle. And then after they come to a price, um, if, the, if the item is a more expensive item, the seller will take the buyer next door down the street and feed him a meal. And this meant that they were brothers to some degree. So when you're buying and selling in the, in the uh, Middle East, it's not like what we do here. Now, let me, get, let me give you something on payment for goods. Payment is not always cash or coins for goods purchased. Barter and trade originally took the place of money. Now, I've had some people say, well, uh, I don't believe in the tithe because you can only give, you can only give uh, uh, cattle or sheep or wheat. No, that's what the law of redemption was for. When they would redeem something, that was so that they could turn it into money. And they did that. They dealt in a bartering system. You can't get out of the tithe by saying that. That's just not true. Uh, you can't come up. We had some people come here one time and said, there is no tithe because we don't have no sheep. Yeah, and we can. Well, if you did have sheep, do you think we, if you were sheep farming, you brought, brought me about 10 sheep in here every month or so, do you think I can go get them to take that for the light bill and for the for the rent on the building and for these tapes we could get somebody to get it put on a shepherd's garb and outfit and drive them down here to beaverwood down on walton ferry and say we need some tapes so here's your pay outside no i'm sorry but that's not going to work they worked on a bartering system back in that day and time and if you can't translate that to modern day and time then that's because you don't want to translate it there was exchange of goods in kind. In early Old Testament times, the giving of money took the form of weighing precious metals to be given to the seller. Thus, Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth in Genesis 23:16. This was the purchase price for the cave of Machpelah. And the Jews had a habit. They would say, uh, you'd say, how much do you want for this? And when they said, and when you read this in the Bible, you can take it for nothing. That was simply their method of haggling. They never actually meant that. When David, there in the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel, he went to the... Uh, uh, he went to the uh, threshing floor of Arana, and he was going to offer God sacrifice. And Arana said, did what the Jew would do. He said, oh, you can take it for nothing. You can have it for nothing. They didn't actually mean that. That was a method of charging a high price. So David said, I will not offer sacrifice unto God of that which doth cost me nothing. And he knew, and any time you see that in Scripture, they didn't mean, I'd like to give it to you. That's not what it meant. That was the way they started their haggling. Concerning the money in the sacks of Joseph's brethren, Scripture says, Every man's money was in the mouth of his sack. Our money is in full weight in Genesis 43 and 21. The first coins did not appear until about 700 B.C., the New Testament refers to the coinage of the Roman Empire, which was in general use in those days for business transactions. But the Oriental seller does not always receive cash. Debt is common among many. Sometimes a poor peasant will sow seed he has borrowed on borrowed land using borrowed tools and will even live in a borrowed house. The parable Jesus told of the unjust steward refers to men who owe their Lord various amounts, such as a hundred measures of oil 
and a hundred measures of wheat. And we have the same thing in America. These are these little tenant houses that sit on somebody's land and they own that property and they, they uh, put these people in the property to work their land. So everything wasn't, and whenever they, they talking about these payment for goods, it was a bartering system they worked in. So you have to translate that into 20th, 21st century ideas and language. You cannot say, well, because, because we don't have the way to pay that they did, we don't have to pay. We don't have to tithe. We don't have to give our offerings because we got no sheep. Well, that's, that's willingly ignorant when a person looks at that that way. Now, let's go back to the book of Revelation. That's all I've got to say this week. What? Yeah. Yeah. There's no excuse around, around, and I've had so many people come here and say, well, there's no tithe, therefore, because we don't have sheep, we don't have wheat, well, then go get some, bring them up here, and we'll convert them to money. Uh, I don't know how people think these light bills are paid, and this rent is paid, and the tapes are paid, and the cameras are paid, and, huh? Get a what? Big wage. Oh, okay. Well, let's go back over here to... Let's go back over here to the book of Revelation. We're in the book of Revelation. And I'm trying to wind up the church at Thyatira. The second and the third chapter of the book of Revelation. Second and third chapter is about... Is about the seven churches of Asia. And of course, I believe it's more than just the seven churches of Asia... For the, for the fact that God gave us this book, and if this book is for us, and the early church fathers put this in the canon of Scripture, it is something for us. This book is for you and I. And we see in the first chapter, we see John is writing this book of Revelation to the seven churches in verse 4. And we see the seven spirits there before the throne of God. And the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, and that's truth. And the Spirit in this is a picture of the oil in the lamps, and it's a picture of the lamps being lit. The Holy Spirit being truth is a picture of light. The lamps with the oil in them are worthless unless they are lit. They have to be lit. When I think of the Spirit, seven spirits, I'm thinking of these seven lamps that are lit and they have a flame on each on the end of them. That gives light. Light is always equated with truth. The Holy Spirit is the oil in us. The, we are the candlesticks, the Scripture says, but without the flame, they're worthless. Holy Spirit in us is not really doing anybody any good until we begin to speak the truth until people can see that in us. Then we see the seven churches named one at a time in verse 11. And we see in verse 12 the seven candlesticks. And we see in 13 the seven candlesticks. And this is a Jewish thing because this is out of the 25th chapter of Exodus where God commissions Moses to make the seven candlesticks. It's the same candlesticks in the temple on the outer section of the temple or the tabernacle, if that's the veil, and here's the Ark of the Covenant, the candlesticks are out here. That's the only official light in Israel. He had in his right hand, this is Christ standing in the midst of these candlesticks. That's a Jewish thing. And then verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. In the right hand of Christ is seven stars. Then he gives us the definition for what the seven stars are and what the seven candlesticks are. We know what they are in the Old Testament. We know what the seven candlesticks are. They are the light inside the tabernacle here. Here's the eastern gate of the tabernacle. We know what they are in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, this is proof that what he's trying to show us is the New Testament 
is a Jewish book, that Revelation is a Jewish book, and every time you see, let me make this very clear, every time you see in the book of Revelation the seven candlesticks, or every time you see the seven angels, it's the same seven angels and the same seven candlesticks as described in verse 20 of chapter 1. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels. Seven stars equals the seven angels of the seven churches. And I keep saying that seven is a number of divine completion. Completion in the Greek, uh, in the Hebrew, that word seven, Shaba or Sheba, comes from the word Shaba, And that word Shaba means to seven oneself or to complete or to go through the trials of life. So when we're talking about the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, we're talking about the seven angels, because that's what it says. It says, these seven stars are these seven angels. It says angels, but it means seven. Of course, angel, angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Angelos means messenger. That's the simple, everyday Greek word that means messenger. That's all it means. It can be a heavenly being, or it can be just you or I, as long as we're a messenger of God. So every, the whole point, I keep saying this, the whole book of Revelation, the reason that God had John write verse 20 was to open up the rest of the book for us. When he says, the seven stars which you saw in my right hand from verse 16, this is the seven angels, or this is the refined ministers, the refined message, seven means to refine, it's the refined message of the refined church. When you see this, these seven stars are these seven angels, He's given that to you so you can understand Revelation, the 8th chapter, and everywhere else you find these seven angels. When you read Revelation 8, and John says, in verse 2, I saw these seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Chapter 2, verse 8, these seven angels is exactly what John is saying in verse 20, of chapter 1, wherever you see, wherever you see one of seven, one of seven angels. If it says one of the seven angels, now you've got four angels, but these, but there's a set of four angels, but these are messengers, they're messengers When you see one of four, it's one of these four. But these four, when you see the four angels set, there's two sets. There's a seven angel set, which are the which is the seven angels of the seven churches. Then you have a four angel set, a four messenger set. That is the four beasts. The four beasts that have the have four faces. And they have the face of a, of a lion. They have the face of, a, of a, an ox. The face of an eagle. And the face of man. When you see these four beasts, let me just show you this. I'm not going to go into it to any depth. But when you see here in chapter 4, in chapter 4, You see in verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, there were four beasts. These four beasts, 
all have these faces, and we're going to go into that. These are called, these, this four angel set, they're called C-H-E-R-I-B-U-M, cherubim. Or you can say cherubim. These are four cherubim. That's the four angel set. Anytime you see one of four, it's talking about these right here. If you see one of seven, it's talking about these up here. Well, let me show you. Look over here in chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. I believe that these four angels are the same four beasts that you find in chapter 4 uh, there in verse 6. And I'm going to go back through this as we study this. Now, and then of course, when you see these seven angels... Each one of these angels stepping forth to open one of the seven seals of chapter 5, verse 1. When you go over here, like, for instance, if you go over to chapter 17, if you go to chapter 17, and he says, verse 1, there came one of the seven angels. You see that? That's the one of seven that's one of seven. That's the seven stars are the seven angels. Without understanding verse 20 of chapter 1, you're not going to know what this is talking about. Or if you back up to chapter 15, if chapter 15 verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, and seven angels... Having the seven last plagues. These are the same seven angels. It's chapter 1, verse 20. You see that? I've said this before, but sometimes I feel like this is not as clear to you as I want it to be. Because this is not something you just reach out and grasp all of a sudden. Every time you see one of seven, it's talking about the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. Right? That's what it's talking about. That's the whole purpose. You can take your concordance. In fact, you can look up here in, in chapter 16, verse 1. I heard a great voice out, of, uh, voice out of the temple saying to the seven, to the seven angels. There is a definite article. It means there's one set of seven angels. It's already been defined in the first chapter, hasn't it? This is all allegorical language. It's idiomatic. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath upon the earth. And when it says in verse 2, the first went, the first angel went. When it says in verse 3, the second angel poured, that's still one of the seven, isn't it? When it says in verse 4, the third angel poured out his vial, that's one of the seven. When you get to verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his vial. That's one of the seven, isn't it? When you see in verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his vial. That's one of the seven. And verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial. And then verse 17, the seventh angel. That's, those are the seven angels. And it's the same seven angels when you back up to chapter 8. He, uh, God has opened up this book for us in the first chapter to cause us to understand it. But you're going to have to think in an abstract fashion, allegorically, is what you're going to have to do. When you back up to chapter 8, the same seven angels, the first one there, these seven angels, which John defines us for us, are the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. But... These seven angels are the seven stars. In the Old Testament, what was the seven stars? Pleiades. Pleiades. So we have a spiritual Pleiades over here, don't we? What is the spiritual Pleiades? What was the, what was the Pleiades called? Morning star. Morning star. And we have a spiritual in the New Testament. And what's the morning star over here? Jesus. Jesus is the morning star. 
So the morning star is the spiritual Pleiades, and there were seven stars in the Pleiades. Therefore, Jesus is the seven stars, isn't he? Well, if the seven stars are the seven angels, or the seven message in each one of us, what is it in us that causes us to preach truth? Christ. That's what he is. He is the sevening of the church, isn't he? When we go through the trials. I watched myself on TV the other night saying some of this, and I thought, I wonder if they're getting a hold of that, because I nearly lose me. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> you, do you understand what I'm saying? I need to really say that slow. Pleiades is the seven stars. Jesus is the morning star. Pleiades was the morning star. Therefore, if the seven stars is the seven angels, and the seven stars is the Pleiades or morning star, that's Jesus. Jesus is the seventh message in the church. That's what he is. Do y'all understand that? Huh? Well, we'll go to that later. Now, I'm not, going, I'm not getting off my, I'm not going off course here right now. Now, so when you see the same seven angels, anytime you see these seven angels in chapter 8, you see the first angel has a trumpet, he sounds in verse 7, the second angel sounds in verse 8, the third angel sounds in verse 10, this is 8 and 10. The fourth angel sounds in verse 12. The fifth angel sounds in chapter 9, verse 1. The sixth angel sounds chapter 9, verse 13. And the seventh, or the last trumpet sounds, the last angel sounds in 10 and verse 7 and in 11 and 15. Those are the same angels he's talking about there in chapter 1. Now, in fact, when you get to the morning star, the study of the morning star, you already have this defined for you spiritually in the New Testament because the morning star being the spiritual Pleiades, being the spiritual seven stars, is in the right hand of Christ. There it is, the seven angels are the refined message in God's refined church. And then he says, the seven stars, there in verse 20, chapter 1, are the angels, or the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now you say, Jim, you've said these things before. Do y'all know every time I repeat these things, I'm trying to get it clear to me? You know, sometimes I teach this stuff over to you and repeat it so I can see it clear because what I'm trying to do is to get... The scripture at the first part of Revelation and all of this in between to come together and synthesize together. And it's taken years for this to come together, for a lot of it to come together in my mind. But believe me, I don't have it as clear as I want to have it. And I keep seeing things all the time. So if you say, you said this before, we already got this. Oh, you do. Would you like to repeat it? I don't believe people have it as when you start seeing these things, it's not like it clears up one day. I got it. Because the more I teach this, I start seeing it. I'm saying, oh, goodness, this over here meshes with this, and this goes with this, and this goes with this. And, I, and I'm looking at all of this going, what in these seven angels am I not understanding? Look at it over here. Wait a minute. Do you look at, do you study things that way? And I'm going... I'm scrutinizing it constantly and thinking about it. Do you study that way? If you don't, you need to learn to. You need to think about these things. Because if you think God just spelled it out real simple where we can just get a hold of everything that he ever did, um, not so. Now, let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2 lists these seven churches. Well, let me put it this way. Chapter 2 lists, chapter 2 and 3, lists the candlesticks, doesn't he? Now, some people will say, they'll say, some preachers, they think that since the church is not mentioned by name, they'll say, well, the church is raptured out in verse 10 of chapter 3 of Revelation. Since you don't find a mention of the church after Revelation 3, 
You don't have a mention of the church. What is the church? The seven candlesticks. They will say, most preachers who believe in the pre-trib rapture, they will say, because thou hast kept, verse 10 of chapter 3, because thou hast kept the word of patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. There's pre-trib rapture. And I don't know how in the world they get that, but they do. It's dumb. And they say, you don't find the church mentioned after that. Well, do you find the seven candlesticks mentioned after that? Huh? Here's the point. Without the message inside the candlesticks, if you got the seven angels, the angel is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? If you got the Holy Spirit here, what's it doing here upon the earth without any candlesticks for it to occupy? It would be worthless, wouldn't it? If you got the seven angels here after the third chapter, is the church here? Well, certainly it has to be here. Well, in fact, do you have any seven candlesticks after the first chapter? Huh? How about chapter 4, verse 5? Chapter 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps. The seven lamps are the same thing as the seven candlesticks, aren't they? Well, there's the church, isn't it? Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Don't say the church isn't mentioned. It's like saying, uh, trying to think of a good illustration. Well, Mike's car is out there. And if I said, Mike's car is out there, and, and uh, I, that gives you kind of a hint that he's around here somewhere. Well, you didn't say Mike was here. Well, I said Mike's car is out there. It kind of gives you a hint that I'm trying to say Mike is around here somewhere. God has different ways of saying things. You understand what I'm saying? He has, he, just because he gives you the pre-trib rapture people say, well, church is not mentioned after the third chapter, therefore the rapture takes place. Yes, it is mentioned. Seven candlesticks, seven lamps are mentioned, aren't they? And you got to say, and if you got the seven angels there, that's definitely, that is, the seven angels is the seven Holy Spirit in us that occupies the lamps. Now, here we are. We're raptured out and taken to heaven, right? Candlesticks. Raptured out and taken to heaven. And the Holy Spirit is the seventh spirit. And it's wandering around here in the air by itself. With no church to occupy. If you've got seven angels, the church has to be here. The container of the seven angels is the church, isn't it? It's just dumb, that the things that they say. Now, we're... And once he defines seven stars, he's defining morning star for us, isn't he? Let's go back over here to the church at Thyatira. We've already gone through these churches. Let's go back down here to... And you know what he's doing in all of this? He's revealing this to us. The word revelation, apocalypsis. It means to take off the cover or to reveal... It means to let people see the truth. What he's doing is showing us the truth about what this book is about. Now, let's go back here. He's talking to the church at Thyatira, and he says in verse 26, He that overcometh, chapter 2, and keepeth my words unto the end, will I give him power over the nations. But I'm going to give him something else. The man that overcomes, of course, the word to overcome is N-I-K-A-I-O-O, Nikaio. It comes from the noun, N-I-K-E, Nike, And that word is victory. And the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. Faith is not something we conjure up. It is the gift of God that he puts into his predestinated elect family. So when he says, he that overcometh, he's talking about his family. 
his elect people. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to them will I give the power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my father, I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, the morning star, we've already said it has a specific meaning. Morning star, Jesus is the morning star. And one more time, I'm going to say this. I'm going to try to finish up as much as this as I can. Morning star was the Pleiades. The rabbis said that the Pleiades, Pleiades was more than just some simple Word in Scripture, when the Bible teaches in, in the 38th chapter of Job, when the Lord tells Job, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion? Pleiades, the rabbi said, would cause the sap to come up in the vine, and in the springtime the blossoms would come out, and you could begin to smell all of the new mown hay and you could smell the uh, the blossoms coming out in the springtime. And this was the influences of Pleiades according to the rabbis. Pleiades was the seven stars. Amos says in the fifth chapter of Amos, Do not seek Bethel nor Gilbagal, but seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. God says, I can bind Pleiades... And I can loose the bands of Orion. Orion was called the evening star. Evening star. And that happened in the winter. In the winter. And it was said that Orion had great cold associated with it, according to the rabbis. And they said it had great cold and it kept the sap from coming up. God says, I can make Orion loose in the middle of winter, freeze your crops. I can make Pleiades. I make Pleiades. I can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and cause no crops. That's why you're supposed to seek him that makes the seven stars or Pleiades or the morning star, which actually is Christ, which is Jesus. That way we will not have a spiritual famine. And famine was the first judgment of God that he would send. Now, I've got an article here out of the Women's Encyclopedia of Myth and Legend. And it gives you all of these names. They don't cover everybody, but they cover a lot. And they go into the Pleiades. Pleiades was one of the ancient gods of mythology. Let me give you a little bit what they say about the Pleiades. Now, you've got two different ideas about the Pleiades. The rabbis said that it, was, that it was, had great warmth and it gave you crops in the spring. Seek him that makes the seven stars of Pleiades. If you go after a god and you obey God, then you don't have famine. <coughs> and if we obey God, we don't have spiritual famine. We don't have a famine of the word. We have Jesus. Now, we have to be obedient to God in order not to have famine. And when you, when, you ha when you were obedient to God, you had the Pleiades, they said. And God said, I can bind Pleiades where you have no crops in the spring. I can loose Orion where all of your crops will die. Now, let me read this to you. It's the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myth and Smiths and Secrets. The convoluted symbolism of Pleiades are the seven sisters. That was another name for it. Sometimes she was called hen and chicken. Sometimes she was called a heap of stars. Suggest an extremely archaic tradition. Now, this is from mythological view of Pleiades. The importance attached to this small group of dim stars seems out of proportion to their apparent insignificance. The sacrifice of the Mexican savior, Zape Totec, our Lord the Flayed One, took place on the hill of the stars at the moment when the Pleiades reached the zenith 
on the last night of the great year cycle, it was thought if the sisters or the Pleiades were not propitiated by the sacrifice, the universe would fall to pieces and the world would come to an end. In mythology, they said there would be final judgment unless they placated Pleiades, but God says that's what the pagans think, but the Pleiades, the rabbis said, gave us crops in the spring. So God said, seek him that makes these stars, these seven stars, so you don't have famine. Pre-Vedic India also attached sacrificial significance to Pleiades called seven mothers of the world or criticos, razors or cutters. They were also seven priestesses who judged men. And notice the convolution here. The Pleiades was said to be seven priestesses who judged men. A cognate was the Greek, Kritikos, a cognate of the, of the uh, Kritik. They were called, the seven, the seven stars were called Kritikos, K-R-I-T-T-I, K-R-I-T-T-I, K-A-S. That's what they were called. But it's a cognate of Kritikos, K-R-I-T-I, T-I, K-O-S. From that word, kritikos, which was a cognate of this word over here, meaning to judge men, we get the word kretes. Remember that word? That's the Greek word, judge. Now, what, look at the convolution here. What's God's judgments on men? Famine, sword, pestilence, beast, Right? Well, what they did, they convoluted this. God said, I judge men by bringing famine. And when you don't obey God, then you don't have the Pleiades giving you crops. They convoluted this into the ancient world among the pagans, and they called this kritikos, or to judge. So actually, among the mythology, they had it right, but it was convoluted. You see what I'm saying? Now, the Pleiades were prominent in, early, in the early cult of Aphrodite. Remember, all of this is written in the stars. Who was supposed to have given birth to them under her name, Pleione. P-L-E-I-O-N-E. Uh, the Pleiades, uh, Aphrodite was a castrating crone goddess as well as holy dove. That's a convolution of the Holy Spirit, which is in us, which is the, the seven angels in us, or the seven Holy Spirit in us. And the Pleiades were a flock of doves. The seven sisters stood at the zenith in a New Year's Eve as if to select the God of the new eon, old Babylonian text, began the year with Pleiades. Later, the zodiacal sign of the new year became Aries the Lamb. Egyptian texts allude to Pleiades' archaic significance as kritikos, or judges of men. Even among the pagan mythology, they said it was a judgment. So, you're going to have it being a judgment, whether it's God's judgment... Like the rabbi said in binding the sweet influences, no crops in the spring, or it's going to be a judgment among mythology. So any way you look at it, the Pleiades was a judgment. In God's judgment, first one was famine. And we're not saying that the Pleiades actually did this. God used all of their culture to bring this out. The dead had to speak the names of these goddesses to pass their critical... From kritikos, we get the word critical, critique, to judge. To pass their critical examinations and enter into paradise. In classical mythology, the Pleiades, or the morning star, if you want to call it that, represented the May time feast. The feast in May. May feast. 
Well, I think that's about the time of the crops coming in, isn't it? So what they said in mythology is the same thing God is saying to Job. Can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? All they did was take the truth and corrupt it. In, in classical mythology, Pleiades represented the Maytime feast of life and the November feast of death at the opposite points of the year. They were emanations of the moon goddess who was worshipped at the two solstices. We're back to fire worship, tree worship. At the two solstices as the goddess of alternatively life and death and death and life, who early in November when the Pleiades set, sent the sacred king his summons to death. Prayers for the dead were recited before the Pleiades on November 1st, which became All Souls Day in the Catholic Church, or it was Halloween. So their convolution goes back to the tree and the fire worship. Greeks said the leader of Pleiades was the dove goddess Alcyon, and the Halcyon, H-A-L-C-Y-O-N, bird, who brought good weather for the planting season. There you are, back to what God says. So in mythology, they were saying basically the same thing that they said among the rabbis that the Pleiades brought crops with no judgment from God. Another Pleiad was Electra, mother of Dardanus, legendary founder of Troy, whose name is still preserved in the Dardanelles. Another Pleiad, P-L-E-I-D, P-L-E-I-A-D, P-L-E-I-A-D, they called them Pleiads. And a Pleiad was one of the goddesses, and they had seven of them. Another one was Merope, meaning bee-eater, a title of Aphrodite's queen bee as a devourer of the drone. Some said Merope was one of the Furies. You remember the Furies? They, demon is the word D-A-I-M-O-N, daemon. It means to distribute fortunes, fortunes. And they said in the first century that all of these gods were demons, and a demon was a god-man or a man who was a god. And they said that fire was a demon and that wind was a demon and that running water was a demon and that all of the different levels of anger that was in a man was called the Furies, and each one of those levels was called a demon. Now, that's first century thought on demons. So the Pleiades, one of them was one of the Furies, one of the demons. Others said she married the doomed sun hero, Sisyphus. Still another Pleiad was Maia, M-A-I-A, the maker or the grandmother, mother of Hermes, the enlightened one. Hermes was the interpreter of the gods. So if you followed the enlightened one, well, if we follow the enlightened one, we follow God, don't we? And we have the Pleiades. So in paganism, they said if they followed the enlightened, if they followed enlightenment, they had the Pleiades. Therefore, they had crops. And as her Hindu counterpart, Maya, mothered Buddha, the enlightened one, Classical writers seemed anxious to disguise the real nature of the Pleiades. One story insisted they were all virgins. Orion the hunter tried to rape them, but Zeus protected them by turning them into doves and placing them in the heavens. The story was obviously absurd. Of course, they're all, it's all absurd to me. As all the Pleiades had lovers or husbands, and three of them had mated with Zeus himself. The huntress of the seven stars, Artemis, shot him to death in the sea, suggesting that victims were sometimes riddled with arrows, then consigned to the deep. Artemis personified another set of seven stars, the much larger constellation, Ursa Major, the great she-bear, who may have been another virgin, of the seven sisters, or that's something better known as Arcturus. 
another version of the Pleiades. And that's why God, look at that one more time over there in Job. Look at Job 38. And you say, Jim, that sounds like so much convolution. Well, it is. It is. I'm trying to point out to you what the pagans believed about the Pleiades is the same thing that the rabbis said about Pleiades. And God uses the culture of the day to point to the people, seek him that makes the seven stars in Orion. The one who can bring famine by not giving you crops in the spring or bringing a warm front in the winter and freezing all of your trees and all your vines. And he says here in verse 31, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Arcturus was another virgin, version of the Pleiades according to this particular dictionary here. Let me read the rest of this. I I'm not going to read the rest. Read one more little short paragraph. East Frieslanders believe that any family of seven sisters, one of the seven was sure to be a vampire or a werewolf. We're back to shape-shifting, back to... And this all has to do with Pleiades in mythology. And werewolves... That's uh, someone who is moonstruck, isn't it? Lunatic. Lunatic. Lunar means moon, and it means moonstruck, and, they, and this goes back into the ancient world. A man who had a demon was said to be able to change himself into an animal, and that goes back to the Garden of Eden when Satan changed himself into a serpent. And that was a demon. And when the young man was brought to Jesus in Matthew, the 17th chapter, his father said, my son is lunatic. He is moonstruck. That's what they believe. And I've gone through all kinds of things on demons, and people don't want to believe it, but they don't know what the first century taught about it. The sevenfold grouping could also be arranged in a vertical line of descent. In the ubiquitous belief, ubiquitous means it's everywhere, that a seventh daughter of a seventh daughter was always a witch. Sounds like an old Johnny Rivers song, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought I might just reveal that to you. Now, what I believe the Pleiades is, is what the Bible says it is. It is the seven stars inside the seven candlesticks. It is the seven stars inside the seven candlesticks, or the seven message... Seven message, which is the, that's the Holy Spirit in us, being seven in us, isn't it? Inside the seven candlesticks. And when you see the seven stars, you see the seven stars, that's in the first chapter of Revelation. That is the spiritual Pleiades, that's spiritually Christ. And the seven candlesticks is the church. That's Christ in the church is what it is. And it is the seven candlesticks. And I'm going to give you this. And when you find this, this is the judgment of God, isn't it? The judgment of God. And the man who has the morning star, he has faith. And he doesn't have a lack of spiritual food in his life, does he? He doesn't have that. Now, I'm going to get back to this. This is the judgment of God. I'm going to go back. Let me, here's the, you'll find this. Here is the, here is the seven candlesticks. When you look at the, I gave some of you, I gave all of you this paper last week. I bet you don't have it with you, do you? Do you? Well, on the Ark of Titus, when Titus came in, destroyed Jerusalem. When he came in, destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. On the Ark of Titus, this is the way the candlesticks look right here. It looks three-dimensional. When you look, you can see the way he has drawn 
you, you, you go from this candlestick here and go over to the other side, and the other side shows up behind this candlestick. He's showing it three-dimensional. And being three-dimensional, here on the left-hand side, looks like a star of David. That's, why, that's because it is a star of David. Now, most people will say we've traced back the star of David to about 200 B.C., and most people try to make it something evil. I do not believe that. Whenever you look up, you look up Megan David, M-A-G-E-N, David. You can look it up in some books among some writers, and they'll tell you that it means star of David. And some will say it interprets shield of David. And that is what we see when we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the seven candlesticks. When you look at it from the top, you've got six candlesticks here. And from the top, from a bird's eye view, you've got the seventh in the middle. That's why they show the floral pattern. The floral pattern... On the bottom of the, of the candlesticks, the base of it is hexagonal shaped. It's hexagon shaped. That's the floral pattern. Now, what we're talking about, I believe, when we're talking about the candlesticks, we're talking about Star of David or Shield of David. I wrote to uh, about 15 Jewish universities back in <coughs> 1974. Mary typed up the letter for me, and I asked all of them all the information they could give me on Star of David because I was researching it back in 74. And I got all this information back, and they, they wrote me back and told me that David carried the menorah on his shield. Menorah on his shield. And I showed this to a Jew one time. When I was in real estate and he was my client, I don't know what the shields of the... Maybe they had round shields. I don't know. That looks like something out of a Roman army, doesn't it? Maybe it was a round shield. Who knows? And that David carried on his shield that he carried the menorah. On his shield. Now, this is what I believe it is. Through all the research... If he carried the menorah on his shield, and they believed that when they went to battle, if their king was obedient to God, and they had the menorah on their shield, that they would conquer all their enemies. But that's not what I believe they had. I believe if history, if they tell us that this is Magon David, or shield of David, that that's what he had. Now, this is what I believe to this point, unless I discover something else. But I believe this is, and there's the center. I believe, well, what am I doing here? I believe this is what he had on his shield. When you look at the menorah from the top, that's what you get. You get shield of David. They said this was the shield of David, and this is the shield of David. Now, that's what I believe that he had on his shield. And when you look at the... At the candlesticks from the Ark of Titus, if you look real close, you can see that it's three-dimensional, can't you? Can't you all tell that? Because if you'll notice, some of the candlesticks are behind the others. And people will say, yes, but over there in Exodus, the 25th chapter, the Bible says that if you're thinking, they didn't think as simple-minded as we do. They didn't think like us. They thought with depth. If the Bible says that, that uh, if this is the center shaft of the candlestick, looking at it from the top, whenever the Bible says that it has three, it has a center shaft and it has three going out of each side, you say, see, that's two-dimensional. That's not necessarily what it would mean when it says three out of each side. If you're thinking like a mathematician thinks, you're thinking, here's one shaft, here's another shaft, 
Here's another shaft. Here's another shaft. Here's a shaft. And here's a shaft. Anywhere you draw a diameter, you got three out of each side. Anywhere you draw that diameter, three out of this side, three out of this side, and so forth. That's what I believe. That's why I believe that on the Ark of Titus, it was three-dimensional. And I believe that is the way you're going to have to answer that over there in... In fact, what would be... Can you get more light spread out by lighting a candle up like this or like that? Certainly, if you had it... If these were all equal length, you're going to spread the light much more than putting it in a line there, aren't you? And I don't believe God is that ignorant when it comes to his physics. Well, I don't know any other way to do this. So when we see this, this depicts the judgment of God. And we're talking about what I'm talking about. I'm getting back the seven candlesticks... According to Zechariah, let's go back one more time. One more time. The seven candlesticks is the church, isn't it? Zechariah. We see the seven candlesticks mentioned. Remember, Zechariah was living in 520. We talked about him this morning. He's telling Israel to come out of Babylon. And we see the seven candlesticks in chapter 4, verse 2. And we see two olive trees feeding the candlesticks. And then we look at verse 10. And the scripture says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven candlesticks. For they are the eyes of the Lord. The seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord. Which run to and fro through the whole earth. Now the Bible says in Zechariah 2 and verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah is prophesying in Babylon under the Persian emperors. After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations. We said this morning that Zechariah's purpose was to stir up Israel to start rebuilding the temple and come back to Babylon, come out of Babylon, come back to Israel. He says that in the previous verse, to deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. He says, for he that toucheth you, the last sentence of verse 8, toucheth the apple of his eye. So if the seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord... Let me erase this. Let me make it real simple. Seven candlesticks. Equal eyes of the Lord, right? This is a simple algebra equation. The Bible says in Revelation 1.20, the seven candlesticks equals the seven churches of Asia, doesn't it? Know what it says? When you put equals, you can put are or is seven churches of Asia. And in algebra, you've got a simple axiom that says things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. If the seven churches of Asia is equal to the seven candlesticks, and the eyes of the Lord are equal to the seven candlesticks, then the eyes of the Lord are equal to the seven churches, aren't they? That's very simple, basic algebra. These two are the same thing because they're equal to the same thing. Isn't that correct? Anyone, you can understand that if you didn't even pass algebra. Now, we're talking about the eyes of the Lord. Let's get back. I want to go back to Ezekiel, the second chapter. But when we think of the eyes of the Lord, we're thinking of the church, the seventh church. Seventh church. 
in the seven, the seven ch- church pronouncing the judgments of God. Isn't that right? Judgments of the Lord. We're th- that's what we're thinking of. The, the church, the church pronouncing the judgments of God. When you look at the eye, the Bible says that Israel is the apple of God's eye. One more time, and I'm going to put the human eye on the board, not in greatest detail, but the human eye. What you've got is you've got the human eye is a wheel inside of a wheel. It's a wheel and a wheel. This is the iris of the eye. The iris comes in two sections. The outer section is a stable section. It stays the same all the time. The inner part of the iris is a wheel. It's a retractable curtain. Curtain. And you get that out of Gray's Anatomy. That's this book right here. I've shown this to some of you. It is a wheel inside of a wheel. Now, the eyes of the Lord show the judgment of God. It's a wheel and a wheel. Now, Israel is the apple of God's eye. Apple is the word baba. It means pupil. The Bible says, if you touch Israel, you touch the apple of my eye, you've punched me in the eye, God says, and has the world touched the church? They've been persecuting us. And God says, I'm going to send my son back and he's going to come back with eyes as a flame of fire. Now, the the eye, when you look at it out of Gray's Anatomy, I don't know if I can find a picture of it real quick, but a side view of it. I've got a picture somewhere. Well, there's the, there's the wheel and the wheel. That's the human eye. And the light, we're the light. The light goes into the pupil. We're the light of the world. And a side view of the eye is like so. Well, hold on. Side view of the eye. And this back here is the optic nerve. Optic nerve. And then you have, you have the, the, the iris of the eye comes out like this. Then you have the pupil right here, the opening right there. You have the lens right back here. And I've had both of those replaced. And when the light goes into the eye and we are the light, it begins to be refined and separates when it goes through a prism into seven colors to seven colors, and there is a lining of the eye that's called Jacob's membrane. It's hundreds of thousands of hexagonal shaped prisms, like so, and that's what we have here. Now, I believe that God made the human eye that way. Whether anybody back there knew it or not, they didn't have the ability to get in the technology, but I believe that God knew that. And those hexagonal shaped prisms, they separate these colors that come from the light. Light is made up of seven colors. And may I remind you again, we're predestined to conform to the image of Christ. Then Romans 8 and 29. And the word image is the word icon. It means likeness. Likeness. And that's why... And when you see things, you do not see shapes. You see refraction of colors. You see refined colors. In fact, some of the writers, it seems to be puzzling to some people. But some say that what you see, the color that you see when you see this white, that's the one color that's absent. When you see that red shirt that Danny's got on, you see the absence of red. The absence of red is the part that's refracting in your eye that's why you see the red because it's absent in your eye now that's what now this is talking about the judgment of God God used a physical phenomena 
He used a physical phenomenon about the human eye. Now, I believe that this, this wheel in the wheel is the judgment of God. Isn't Jesus' eyes as a flame of fire? Isn't he coming back with eyes as a flame of fire? When you punch someone in the eye, the iris of the eye bends back. It bends back real tight. And then the iris, the, the uh, pupil begins to close up. When somebody punches the eye, the pupil starts closing up and protects what's in the eye. And you have this bow bending back. And that is the... That's the iris. It bends back. And the inner wheel in the wheel begins to close up to protect the eye. And we are the pupil of God's eye. And the bow of God, I believe that's a picture of God's war bow. And when God put a bow in the cloud, it doesn't say he put a rainbow in the cloud. It says he put a bending. It was actually a war bow. In the ancient world, if they hung their bows On the wall like so with the bow upward. That meant they were at peace one writer says. If they went into their hut or wherever they were. And they hung it this way with the bow bending down. They were at war. They just had to go back out the next day and fight. When they broke their bow. They were giving in to their enemies. Now I want to show you what I believe the wheel and the wheel is. Let's go back to Ezekiel. Back to Ezekiel the first chapter. Ezekiel first chapter. Oops, hold on. Put that back over there. Ezekiel 1. This has been mysterious to people for so long. I've studied this. I believe that I see what it is. Now, hold on. Hold on. Ezekiel, the first chapter. Ezekiel is in the captivity. And we're going to look at the wheel and the wheel. Let me get my old Bible out. I may have some notes in Ezekiel that I don't have at present here. All right. Ezekiel. Chapter 1. We see the wheel and the wheel. But before we get to the wheel and the wheel, let's start reading here in verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar. This is Ezekiel being carried into captivity. This is somewhere around 595 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar, when he sent Babylon in, he had three deportations of carrying Israel into captivity. Of course, they were carried captive because because they had gone after Baal in the grove. They had one deportation around 605, one in 595, 596, 595, and the final one was the total destruction of southern Judah in 586 B.C. It's believed that Ezekiel is carried away in this second deportation into captivity. And he goes on to say, As I was among the captives of Judah, being carried captive into Babylon. That's what Ezekiel is saying. And if you've been here on Sunday morning for any amount of time, you don't even have to have this explained to you, do you? By the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened... And I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth day of King Jehoiakim's captivity. And Jehoiakim was carried away. He wasn't the last king to be carried away. The last king to be carried away was Zedekiah. So Jehoiakim was carried away somewhere in that second captivity into Babylon. So therefore, Ezekiel is sometime about the same time of Jehoiakim's deportation. And the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, or Babylon, by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Now this is Ezekiel about to get a vision from God. 
And he begins to relate this great army of the of Babylon coming in and destroying southern Judah. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Now, we've said before that God used the word whirlwind, and he used the word scorpions, or scatter, to scatter. And he used the word east wind to define the Babylonians coming in. The Babylonians, they, when you look at the map, here is, this is all desert down here. So anyone who came in to attack Israel, the green part of the map is where foliage is where you could travel. There's no way the Babylonians could take off across this desert and go a thousand miles to Jerusalem. They'd all be dead before they got there. So they always came up north and would attack Israel from the north. And that's what's happening here. <clears throat> and I looked and behold... A whirlwind out of the north, a great cloud. This is a picture of the Babylonian chariots. And a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, and that word amber is yellow. Out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the, let me just say this. Right back in the very center of the eye, when you, when you take a straight shot right through the pupil to the back, is a place called the yellow spot, or it's amber. And yellow, the yellow spot are the fovea centralis. And yellow is the color of fire all through Scripture. Now, I'll get to more of the explanation of the fire after a bit. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of, of four living creatures. I believe these are the same four angels, four living creatures that you find in Revelation, the fourth chapter, the four beasts with all of these four faces, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, and the face of man. This represented all mankind. Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like a sole of a calf's foot, <clears throat> and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass." When you see that word color through here, it's always the word A-Y-I-N. That is the Hebrew word I. Of course, God had them write, evidently translate the word I, meaning color, because that's what they saw. That when they thought of seeing... I see that orange, that yellow book over there with the orange print on it. Well, I see yellow and red over there. Well, that's the way they thought of it. But that's actually the way it is. Now, these are the same four beasts. Let's read on down. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another. And they turned not when they went. And they went everyone straight forward. You say, what is that talking about? I'll tell you what I believe it is. I believe these are chariots coming in to destroy Israel. And all of the war chariots, I've, I've shown you the war chariots, the Assyrians invented them, passed them to the Babylonians, and all the war chariots had, had six spokes. And you can actually connect those and you got a six-sided hexagon or you can show the Star of David in, in here. Now, I believe that's the basic figure of this. Now, I've 
I've studied this for a long time. I believe if you'll notice these chariot wheels and the, the, the Assyrians invented them, they passed them down to the Babylonians and they passed them down to the Egyptians and the Assyrian war chariots was a wheel inside of a wheel just like the eye. You say, would God give us something that complex? I believe God would create this for his own pleasure and, cre- and have some pagan, some pagan Babylonian chariot maker or Assyrian chariot maker make these Assyrian war chariot wheels. The first time I looked at this after I'd studied the eyes of the Lord for a long time, that scared me the first time. I went, whoa. What is that? And I kept trying to find the yellow spot. The eye of the Lord is a picture of judgment. Were these Assyrian war chariots a picture of judgment? And if the seven candlesticks are the seven churches, and and the church declares the judgment of God, then the church is the eyes of the Lord... And God uses evil men as a sword in his hand, David said, doesn't he? Were these chariots a picture of the judgment of God? God said, I call these Babylonians down against Judah to destroy them. This is my judgment. Why wouldn't he have some Babylonian make the Assyrian war chariot wheels to look like the human eye of a sword? Why wouldn't he do that? If he did it, he did it for his own pleasure unless the priests of God recognized it. That's amazing to me. Can you imagine one of these coming to a stop right in front of some priests, him going, oh my God, oh God, the judgment of God is here. If he knew something about this. Because the basic structure of this is a star of David, isn't it? Huh? You got, you got six spokes. Don't you have the bait? Isn't that what you have? Huh? That's what you've got. That's a war chariot. Well, where is the yellow spot? Where is the yellow spot that you have in the eye over here? This is the eye of the Lord. When they saw this, they saw the judgment of God coming. What are these cherubim? Let me give you, I'll come back to the cherubim in a minute. Let's go to Nahum and let's look at the yellow spot in the middle of these chariot wheels. I wrestle with that sometime, but look over here in Nahum. And I'll come back here to Jeremiah. In Nahum. Huh? What did he say? I need more time in it. Nahum, second chapter, talking about the Assyrians coming down to destroy Israel. Chapter 2, verse 1. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel for the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. This is a picture of Assyrian chariots coming in to destroy Israel. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. The chariots shall rage in the streets of Israel. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like lightnings. Torch and lightning, the color of that is fire. And that's always the color of yellow. And when you look at these chariot wheels from the side, when you have a side picture of the chariot wheels. And we're still talking about the man that overcomes gets the seven candlesticks. He is the pronouncer of the judgment of God. He has the Pleiades. These chariot wheels coming in are a picture of the church pronouncing the judgment of God, isn't it? God uses evil men to pronounce his judgment. 
the church is not evil, but it's a picture of us. When you look at these chariot wheels from the side, they had what they called iron chariots. And the iron chariots, if this were a chariot wheel view, right in the center of the chariot wheels, they had these, these scythes. And they had them all the way around the wheel, right in the center. And as they would, as the chariot wheels would, would uh, run through the streets, these were scythes that they used to cut down wheat in the field. And it cut down Israel instead. And they were the wheat, weren't they? Weren't they the bread? Weren't they called a barley loaf? And aren't we called the bread of God? We being many are one bread and one body. In order to refine us, we have to be cut down. And Israel had to be cut down by these scythes, by these iron chariots. And when they would, when they would be racing through the streets in the sun, they looked like torches. Or they had the color of yellow. That was a yellow spot in the center of the eyes of the Lord, which is the judgment of God. Now, now I believe that's what this is. You can say, boy, that's a wild imagination. You can say what you want. Do I believe that God just stuck that here? I believe God has used all kinds of biology and chemistry and physics and we don't even know it's in the Bible. But I believe, why did I believe he did it? For his own good pleasure. I did that one tape on, on the uh, biblical chemistry. And it scared me so bad when I saw it, began to see it. I went, oh man, this scares me. To realize that God structured the atomic structure of, of salt, sodium chloride, to be the way it is. Do I believe he did these things? I believe the Bible is full of what man thinks he discovered, whether it's Archimedes or Pythagoras or these guys, thinking they discovered calculus. And it's full of chemistry and physics and, and only God knows how much more. But I believe he laid this stuff out and I believe we can find some of, of it if we look hard enough. If we think about it now. Let's go back over to, what do, you, what do I believe these four creatures are? Well, let's read on down. Down here in verse 10. For the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four had the face of an eagle. I think that's the same as we find in Revelation, the fourth chapter, isn't it? Revelation 4, let's look back at it. If it's the same, it has the same meaning. It has the same meaning. Revelation, the fourth chapter, and verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne and round about the throne there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind and the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf or like an ox and the third beast had the face of a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle and these are the are these the messengers of God to pronounce judgment? These are the same four angels of seven and one of Revelation. Well, then it has to be the same four. But we have to go back to the beginning, back to Genesis 9 to find out what these are about. Genesis 9 Noah comes out of the ark. This is where you got to go back to to find this. And people say, well, it just seems God wouldn't make the Bible that complex. Oh, you don't think so? You don't, you think that uh, 
he makes it, he makes the Bible for simple-minded Baptists in America, people that can't think past one plus one is two. Is that what you think? Look here. Noah's coming out of the ark. Verse 8, chapter 9, Genesis. God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl. What's the king of the fowl according to the Bible? The eagle. All the way through Scripture. Of the cattle. The king of the cattle is the ox. This has to do with covenant with God's people. And government with God's people has to do with refining his people and pronouncing judgment and of every beast of the earth with you. What's the king of the beast? What's the most regal of all beasts in the Bible? The lion. Then he says, and Noah with you, with man. With Noah. That is the picture of the covenant of God whenever you find these four beasts. Well, what were they doing... And he says, with you and from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Wherever you find these four beasts, it is a picture of the judgment of God. I think we've got the bow here, don't we? In the ninth chapter, where he puts his bow in the cloud. Well, let me turn back there. Chapter 9, excuse me. Verse 13, I do set my bow, not rainbow. Bow. But the goddess of the rainbow was called Iris. You think that doesn't have anything to do with any of this? I do set my bow, my keseth. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. Q-E-S-H. Keseth. In the cloud. And it shall be for a token for a sign. It shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And there are seven colors in the rainbow. And I like what he says over here right before the flood. If you look over here, in chapter 7, in verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And that word fountain is the word mayana, M-A-Y-A-N-A-H, A-Y-A-N-A-H. The greatest rivers in the world are under the crust of the earth. The fountains of the great deep were broken up. And this comes from the base word, this word mayana. The base word is A-Y-I-N. The eye of the Lord was broken up. And is there any tears here? I guess so. Have they been punching God in the eye before the flood? Yeah, the sons of God were marrying the daughters of men. Am I out of time? Oh, man. Where are these, in the first chapter of Ezekiel, where are these cherubim? Because when you look at the fourth chapter of Revelation, the cherubim, the cherubim were around the throne of God. The throne of God was the Ark of the Covenant. You had two cherubim woven into the, woven into the uh, veil, and then you had one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. I believe one had the face. See, nobody really knows what they look like. But I believe the Bible tells us that one had the face of a man. One had the face of an eagle. One had the face of an ox. And one that had the face of a lion. You had four cherubim around there. Where were the cherubim? Here they are, right here. And the Bible says they had straight feet. The cherubim were on the sides of the ar- uh, sides of the chariots, and wherever the wheels went, the Bible says they had straight feet, and they didn't run, and they went wherever the wheels went. 
Here's cherubim right here. The Assyrians had stolen this. Some believe they had taken it from Israel. Now, they got a whole stack of these pictures of these, if I can find them here. Y'all excuse me a minute. Here's cherubim right here. Well, y'all excuse me. I believe they were on the sides. Of, I believe that was the judgment of God. And they were on the sides of those. Here's what the Assyrians and the Babylonians called cherubim right there. The face of a man, winged. That's what they call cherubim or cherubim. If the Syrians had them, they took them from the Jews. There's, there's cherubim. There's a face of an eagle, isn't it? Huh? One of the writers, there they are right there. The eagle. The eagle. Here's chariots. Some of them show the cherubim on the side. Some of them don't have the cherubim on the side. And the Babylonians got them. There's the, the winged cherubim. That's what they called them. They called them the winged figure. Here's more. There's the face of a lion. That's the way they made their... Here's some cherubim coming down with the body of a bull and the face of a man. That's what the Assyrians called them. And, it, and I've got much more. Here's a cherubim. There's a, supposed to be an eagle, I guess, flying above that horse. Some would have them on the sides of the chariot. And if you notice, there's a six-spoke wheels on the... And I got this out of Layard's Nineveh. There's some. There's one right there. There's a, the head of a man, the body of a lion. I've got some right here. Huh? That's right. And Babylon got them. There they are. Here's a whole bunch of them right here. This is under cherubim or cherubim. And what this is, is a picture. There's a whole page of them right there. That's what they call cherubim. That's what the Assyrians called it. And they had them on the sides of their war chariots. I like what one of the writers says. Let me see here if I got it. I think I got it right here. And first time I ever read this years ago, I thought it was funny. Because... First time I read it, I, I just chuckled because I said, this is what McClinic and Strong says. We may compare also the absurd explanation of Claremont that they, the cherubim, are the northern army of the Chaldeans. And when I read that, I said, yeah, and Jim Brown believes that too. I didn't know anybody else believed that except me. A guy named Claremont believes it. And McClinic and Strong calls it absurd say that the cherubim were the war chariots coming down and I didn't know anybody else had discovered that and I said yeah I said Claremont and Jim Brown believes that that's what I believe they were I believe this is God's picture his pictorial way his expressive way of showing things to us but you got to do some thinking and you have to be back about 2500 years ago thinking the way they thought because they knew what cherubim were. Well, I've run out of time. I'll come back and try to finish this chapter in chapter 2 and chapter 10 of Ezekiel. Because you're going to have those there. Uh, nothing other than the fact that they probably had these wings on the chariots. Now, the ones in the temple in Revelation 4, this is, this is a picture of God's protection to us. Wings usually had to do with, something that had wings had something to do with covering a lot of space and territory. When the Bible will compare something with an eagle, it's talking about how it flies a long range or a long distance. Now, I'm, rest, I'm still, I can't, I can't say that I've figured all of this out. I'm giving you the part that I see. You, what you have to do is go back and study wings 
and I'll do a lot more of that. Now, I've been studying on this for years. I do know what the cherubim are. I don't have any doubt. And doesn't Genesis, the, the ninth chapter, spell out the cherubim for us? Doesn't it when it says, God says, I'll have a covenant between the fowl and the cattle and the beast and man? Therefore, from then on out, you can take this, and that's a picture of the covenant of God. Now, it's spiritual when you get to Revelation 4th chapter. I can't differentiate every little fine, minute point. But when it says later on in this chapter that he says that these, that, that Ezekiel says, I saw as it were in verse 16, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. I believe that's the chariot wheels coming in. I believe this is the destruction of Jerusalem. It's the eyes of the Lord. And I believe God moved upon the heart of pagan blacksmith to make something for his own pleasure, for God's pleasure. And he's letting us see a little of this. Most people think, well, God wouldn't be this complicated. He wouldn't. He'll be complicated for himself. He'll give us enough of Scripture where we can find his repentance for our lives. But I believe there's much more in this book than we have any possible idea that we can ever comprehend. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Thank you for unraveling this book for us. Lord, help us to continue to see, Lord. Correct us, Lord, in things we can't see. And open our eyes to see what you have magnificently laid out here. And God will continue to praise you and glorify you and give you honor for all things. In Christ's name we pray, amen.